I am with you always until the end of the world. How's everybody doing tonight? Good, it's going to get even better. We're going to continue our series on the armor of God. And uh, just to recapulate what we did last week, we saw that the devil prowls about like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And every now and then he finds someone who's weak and helpless and alone and lost and lonely and feeble and afraid and the rest of it. And when he finds somebody like that, he charges. And I asked you, if you were one he was charging against, what would you do? The only thing you can do is to stand and fight. But you can stand and fight just the way you are. You need to stand and fight wearing the armor of God. We also looked at a couple of facts about the enemy, the devil. We saw one, that he's real. Two, that he's not powerful. Two, that he's not all-knowing. Three, that he's not omniscient. And five, that he is a defeated enemy. And as Jesus said, having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. He defeated the enemy and made a mockery of him. Now the question that a lot of people had last week after the talk, a lot of people came to me and asked me, why does a defeated enemy create so much of havoc in the world? Why does it still look as though we're losing if the war has already been won? Why does he trouble us and our families so much all the time? Why are so many of us affected in such a negative way if the war has been won? I'm going to attempt to address and answer those questions tonight and in the couple of weeks to follow where I'm going to continue the subject of the armor of God. I'm going to read to you today from 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 to 6. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. This, my brothers and my sisters, is the word of the Lord. There is an old proverb that says age and treachery will always defeat youth and zeal. Age and treachery will always defeat youth and zeal. We're zealous people here. We're also youthful people here. But we have an enemy that is as old as time. 
and as treacherous as a deep ocean. What do we do against an enemy like that? Who knows all the devious ways to get us to fall? Who's cunning beyond comprehension? Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 10. He says, be gentle like doves. But he also says, be cunning like serpents. Because it is only when you are able to think sometimes like the enemy thinks you will be able to defeat him. And all of us here are required to defeat the enemy. Assuming it is what we want to do. We want to, right? But there are three important facts that we need to know before we can even begin fighting with him. And the first fact is something that we looked at last week. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. But against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. The first thing we need to know is that our struggle is not against people. You have a problem with your mother, you have a problem with your father, you have a problem with your husband, you have a problem with your wife, you have a problem with your children, you have a problem with your pastor, you have a problem with your priest, with your colleague at work, you have a problem, you're making a mistake. If you think that the enemy. Yes, any of these people mentioned might be mean to you, might be cruel to you, might be unkind to you, might put you down, might humiliate you, but this person is not the enemy. And if you think that this person is the enemy, you have lost the battle even before it has started. Is everybody with me? The second thing we need to know comes from what we just read. Even though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does because the weapons we use are not the weapons of this world. Now, most of us, unfortunately, try to deal with the enemy and his attacks with weapons of this world. If somebody pushes you, what do you do? Push him back. If somebody hurts you, what do you do? Hurt him back. If you feel so depressed you want to commit suicide, what do you do? You go to a psychiatrist where you spend hundreds of dollars just to get the opportunity to talk to him. And six months later, what happens? You are no better than when you started, except maybe a little broker than when you started. And if your depression does go away, how does it go away? By the medication that he loads you with. But you are not well. Has any of you lost his peace? What does the world say you do? The world says you go and sit on this nice big blue carpet. You have incense candles lit over there so you get this wonderful perfume. You have pipe music coming from the rafters. And very good. You feel at peace. How many of you have tried this? Don't raise your hands. The peace lasts as long as you are in that place. What happens when you get out from there and get out into the world? Paul and Silas were one day in jail. They had no blue carpet there. Instead, they sat on dirty, rough ground. They had no perfumed candles there. Instead, they had the stench and decay of rot in that cell. They had no piped music coming from the rafters. Instead, all around them were moans and groans of people. How would the world be able to give Paul and Silas any peace? Yet, they had the peace, and I'm going to talk about them a little later. Paul, in his letter to the Ephesians, speaks about two mighty weapons. This is verse 17. He says, take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And then he continues. He says, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. Have any of you seen a good fighting movie lately? I'm not the, talking of the type where they use guns. You know, they have all these old guys shooting guns nowadays. It's, I, I mean, it's the most boring thing imaginable. Have you seen a movie with swords? 
the more powerful the guy, the better the sword they use. And imagine what kind of a sword the Holy Spirit would have. And here he's saying to us, I need you to take up a sword like that and to use it. And what a mighty weapon that will be in our hands. And we're going to come to learn how to use that sword. But now let me talk about the third thing that we need to keep in mind. And the third thing is this. There is a real battle that takes place. The battlefield is in the mind. We have to recognize that this is where the devil does his work. This is where the demons come and start whispering their evil. This is where he talks about his lies and he gets you to believe them. I'm always reminded of a story I heard lately. There was this woman who'd gone out with her friends and she heard two of her friends sitting in one corner and whispering among themselves and laughing. And every now and then they would turn to look at her. And she thought, what would you think? What would you think? They're talking about her, laughing at her. So she got very upset and she kind of distanced herself from them. The next day they tried to call her and talk to her, but she said, no, I don't want to listen to you at all. A couple of days later, they called her again, insisting that she came to their house. And she says, no, I don't want to come. I'm busy. She said, look, if you don't come, we're going to come and pick you up. So finally, she said, okay, I'm coming. Very reluctantly, she sat in her car and made her way to this friend's house, grumbling all the time, moaning and complaining. And then finally, she reaches this person's house and rings the doorbell. The house is open. And a hundred people inside yell, happy birthday to you. Now, how often does this happen to you? How many times have you gone for a job interview and you keep telling yourself, I'm not going to get this job. I'm not going to get this job. How many times do you struggle with an addiction and tell yourself, I will never be able to get rid of this addiction. How many times have you struggled in a relationship that doesn't seem to be working and you say, I cannot do this, I cannot love this man or I cannot love this woman. How many times have you said things like this to yourself? It is the devil whispering in your ear telling you all these lies. And our problem is we believe him. And our problem is we believe him and we listen to the lies that he whispers to us. One of the things that people came and told me after the session last week, and a lot of them, not one or two, okay, a lot of them, they came and said, my sister is at home and she is suffering because she is suffering personal attack from this enemy. And you're saying, he's not powerful? Someone else came to me a day afterwards and said, look at the world around us. Nobody goes to church anymore. Churches are being sold, turned into gurudwaras and temples and even discotheques. Are you telling me that God has won this war? What do you think? It is the devil telling us that he is winning. What we need to understand is that we are being lied to, that we have been lied to, and will continue to be lied to. So what do we need to do? Just as Paul says over here, you take every thought captive and make it your slave. I spoke about World War II last time. Do you remember what I said? I said Germany for the longest time believed it was winning the war and the whole world thought so too. Until one day the allies got together and hammered the daylights out of this country. And then what did they do? They took the German soldiers captive. What happens when you're captive? Sorry Patricia, you're just close to me. Your things are taken away from you. Your freedom is taken away from you. You're taken and you're locked up somewhere where you cannot do anything. And there you are. Back to everybody else. You are in my control. You dare to move, I will shoot you. Stay there a minute. We need to do that. Whenever the devil plants thoughts in our mind, 
Whenever the devil starts to tell us things, we need to take these thoughts captive and make them prisoner. But how do we do that? Let me let this prisoner free, though. Thank you. You're the sweetest. See, that's what happens when you don't come here for two weeks. Yeah, I take notice and then I take revenge. <laughs> and we need to learn a few more things before we go forward. How does the devil put these thoughts in our mind? Paul speaks about them as being strongholds. What strongholds are, are fortresses that he erects in our mind. They're very hard to break. You know, in the old days, when people used to go to war, people used to build forts around their cities. And it used to be very hard to break down these forts. And the devil has built strongholds in our mind. And what are these strongholds? I want us to examine the strongholds that he might have built in your mind. Because unless you destroy them, nothing is going to happen. And the first stronghold is pride. How many of you are proud over here? Thinking that you know everything. Thinking that you have a perfect understanding of everything. Thinking that you're better than everybody else. How many of you are proud? When you're proud, you make God your enemy. Because God says in his word, I will give grace to the humble, but oppose the proud. So when we are proud, we're actually letting the devil rule in our minds and saying, God, you are the enemy. So the first thing we need to get out of our lives is pride. Tell ourselves we're nothing. And really, you are nothing. The second stronghold that the devil builds in our minds is prejudice. Is there anyone you don't like for some strange reason? You know? You don't even know people sometimes and you don't like them. Ask Indians how they like the Pakistanis or ask Pakistanis how they like the Indians and they'll kind of tell you, you know, we don't like them. Why? Doesn't matter. We just have this prejudice built in our minds because of something that happened in 1947. But it's across cultures, it's across countries, it's across lands. We don't like people from other prayer group. And other people from other prayer groups don't like us. Why? Simply because we belong to other prayer groups. Is there any reason? Is there any justification? Except this little thought that the devil has planted in our mind is that prayer group is bad and that leader is bad. Is it true what I'm saying? What are the prejudices that you have? People in your office that you just don't like. Maybe people of a different color. Maybe people of a different background. Maybe people who just think differently from you and you're prejudiced against them. And what does the devil do? He uses that prejudice against you. And then the third stronghold that he builds in our mind are preconceptions. Suppositions that we have. Have you been hurt as a little child? And you will remember that hurt, and that hurt makes you bitter and cruel and angry. Have you been disappointed? Have you been let down as a child? And that makes you insecure. And that insecurity is something that the devil can use very powerfully, and he will use it. He will use it to make you go and do things that you shouldn't do, and make you hurt people that you shouldn't hurt. Look at all the hurt that you're causing somebody now. Look at all the hurt you are causing somebody now. You asked how the devil can control us? He controls us through other people. He goes and whispers something in somebody's ear. And that's all it takes. Uses your fear. Uses your insecurity. Uses your anger. Uses your frustration. Uses your bitterness to go and hurt somebody else. You have any good friends, Patricia? Name one of them. All right, you tell her, whisper in her ear, Anil, he's not a good guy, really. I mean, I know he preaches well and all, but actually he's this, you know, he's this guy who drinks on the side, he gets drunk, and after he gets drunk, he goes to the red light areas of Dubai, and he spends his time with women, and, and she goes, no, that can't be true. And he goes, no, no, it is true, I've seen him. He's never seen me, ever, but that's all it takes. That's all it takes.
She's hoping I won't come to her, so I won't come to her. This is Mildred. She's my friend. I can do these things to my friends, yeah? And I just thank God they remain my friends after doing this. Oh, that lady I growled at last week is not here tonight. Oh, dear me. See, sometimes I might lose friends. Never mind. Your daughter, Mildred, you know, she's very sweet and she plays the keyboard very beautifully. But I don't think she's very sweet, really, you know. She's got all these problems with her and she's back answers and, you know. And at school I saw her bullying the children and, You give me 10 minutes with you guys, I can convince you of anything, all right? The devil has your entire lives in front of him. Man, he's there whispering his lies to you all the time. And you buy it, you know? We buy it, no matter what he says. This person doesn't like you. Your boss is out to get you. Your husband is having an affair. Your son is doing drugs. Man, he can just psych you out so easily, so easily. So how do you defend yourself? Through the Word of God, and one of the most powerful verses that I've discovered in the Word of God, actually there are more than a couple of them, from Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 to 8. I want to read this to you. It's simply amazing. And it will give you all that you need to basically uh, defend yourself. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Everything you need. Everything you need to leave this place and start claiming the victory is contained in these three verses. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say to you, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to others because the Lord is near. Patricia, you really love me? Really? You happy when I come near to you? Really? Mildred, do you love me, child? You do? And you feel happy when I'm near to you? Can I come closer? She's happy. And what is, that's what God is saying to us. Be happy. Rejoice in me because I'm near. Do you believe the Lord is here? Why do you all of you look so mournful then? Seriously. Look at the person next to you. Go on. I know she's your wife, but never mind. Say you're Jesus. Go on. Do that. See, you're looking happy already. If Jesus was really sitting next to you, man, would you be happy or not? I was in Lebanon sitting next to the patriarch, and I'd have no idea what to say to him, but I was happy. I was sitting next to the patriarch. Right? He's the cardinal of Lebanon, by the way. Now, if I had Jesus sitting next to me, I might not know what to say. I'd probably be very intimidated to actually have him sit next to me, but I'd be happy that he was there. I'd be more than happy. I'd be rejoicing. Have you heard that song? Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. The first thing you do is you rejoice. And when the devil comes close to you, he finds you rejoicing. What's he going to do? He's going to get mighty pissed. So what's he going to do to you next? He's going to try to take away that joy from you out. Right? Because as long as you're joyful, he cannot do anything to you. You're too happy to care about him. You notice he will never come to you when you're happy. He can't touch you. When you're happy, you're just jumping and bouncing about the place. 
You want to try something? Janet said, I've not done this in a long time. It's a song that I used to sing a lot in the old days. You know the song? I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Where? I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Down in my heart to stay. And I'm so happy, so very happy. I've got the love of Jesus in my heart. And I'm so happy, so very happy. I've got the love of Jesus in my heart. <laughs> Now, he doesn't like that one. So what does he do? He comes to steal it away. But then God tells you what to do in the next thing. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and petition, present your requests to God. And the peace of God that transcends all understanding will God your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. It's the same thing that Ephesians says. Pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of requests and petitions. All kinds, everything. So what is it the devil is going to come to you and say? He's going to come and he's going to whisper, right? He's going to whisper. He's going to whisper stuff that he just whispered. I don't want to listen to you. Jesus, I'm praying. I'm praying right now. I know my son has not come home on time. I know my daughter is a little late. But I believe in you and I believe that you have angels looking after her. So please, Lord. Please, Lord. They'll be okay, right? And what is God going to say to you? No, you need to worry more. He's going to say, don't worry. Be happy. And then what do you have to do? Be happy. Or your husband smiles at this beautiful woman at a party and the devil comes and whispers, see, he likes her. Okay, does he do that or not? Ladies, be honest. See, they're all shaking their heads. Good, I'm glad you're honest people over here, right? And all you have to do is turn to Jesus who's near you, right? Is he near you? And say, Jesus, see, he's looking at that girl, Lord, you know, and I'm kind of getting upsy and antsy over here, you know. Can you please fix that? And what is he going to say to you? Don't worry. Be happy. And then watch you. You, you have a choice. You can still kind of continue to look at your husband. Otherwise, say, let him be, you know. In the end, he's going to come home to me, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> be, be happy. So whatever it is, this is what God is saying to you, right? Trust that the Lord is near and ask him whatever it is that is bothering you. And then he says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Things will come your way. People will come your way. The devil will feed you with all kinds of thoughts about them. Don't think about them. Think about what is noble instead. Think about what is pure instead. Think about what is lovely, whatever is admirable instead. One of the things the devil will come and tempt you. Doesn't he do that? That is also something that he does here in the mind. And when I was in Lebanon, I had a great time with the youth doing this demonstration that I've not done here in a long, long time. And whenever I don't do things in a long time, I just get this urge to do them again. Does any of you have an apple? What are you doing with an apple, child? <laughs> and a red, nice, juicy one as well. How many of you have seen this before? Raise your hands. Okay, not many of you. Praise God. Good, good. I want to teach you how the devil wages war in your mind, all right? Imagine if God says to you, if you eat of this apple, you're going to die. And I take this apple and I give it to you. Are you going to take it? No. 
She wasn't sure what to say. But <laughs> you're not going to take it because you're going to die, right? And the devil knows that. So what does he do? I need an apple tree. Can you be an apple tree for me? Please come. 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 Don't worry. I'm not going to embarrass you. I just need you to stand over there and be a tree. Come. Look at everybody. Come from that side. Okay. Spread, stretch your branches out. <laughs> and hold this apple. You're the prettiest apple tree I've ever seen in my life. Now imagine that you're here one day, looking at the apple, wondering why God asked you not to eat it. The devil comes along. Beautiful, isn't it? And what do you do? And then he says, do you wonder what it will feel like to bite into that apple and have the juices trickle down your throat? And you go. And then he goes away. His job is finished for then. Until the next time, when you happen to be looking at that apple, only this time wondering what it will feel like to bite into it and have the juices trickle down your throat, he comes again. And what does he do? Beautiful, isn't it? Yes, I know. <laughs> and then he plucks the apple from the tree. Thank you very much. Please put your hands together for her. And he takes the apple and he says, hold it. And you go, no, 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 no. Hold it. God didn't ask you not to hold the apple, did he? He only told you not to eat it. So you think about it and you reason and you said, yeah, God never said nothing about holding no apple, so you take it and you hold it. And then he says, feel it. <laughs> Do I make a good devil? <laughs> <laughs> See how smooth and soft it is to the touch. And so you feel it, and yes, it is soft, and it is smooth to the touch. And then he says to you, smell it. God didn't ask you not to smell the apple, did he? He only asked you not to eat it. So you smell it. Oh. Oop. Oops. <laughs> And you're dead. And you're dead. Man, this is good apple. <laughs> Tell me when you first died. The moment you died was not when you bit, bit into that apple. The moment you died is when you thought about biting into it and have the juices trickle down your throat. That is the moment you really died. And that is the only time you really can say no to the devil when he comes to you and he whispers. And he says, beautiful, isn't it? You don't say yes. You say no. Because he does it all the time. How does all temptation begin? It all begins with these words that he says. Beautiful, isn't it? You go to a party and you meet a beautiful girl over there and what does the devil do? Oh, forget a party. Even, even a prayer meeting like this. Yeah, you see a pretty girl and there he is, the devil comes. Beautiful, isn't she? And what do you do? <laughs> right? And then what does he do? He says, why don't you take her home and love her? After all, God said, love your neighbor, didn't he? <laughs> and, and what do you do? <laughs> and what do you do? <laughs> You got to be careful of the guy. I told you he's devious and he's smooth. I mean, almost as smooth as me. <laughs> so you got to watch out for him. And how do you watch out for him? By remembering that Jesus is by your side. By remembering you have a sword in your hand. And the sword is the word of God. 
And those of you who remember the time when Jesus was tempted will remember that he was tempted three times by the devil. And three times Jesus said, it is written. Three times he quoted scripture. And what happened after he quoted scripture? Scripture says the devil left him and angels came and attended him. And this is why we need this sword. But before we need the sword, we need to equip ourselves with armor. And there are two objects of armor that really are needed in this war that we've just said. He said, God will guard your heart and your mind. And these are two things we need to guard. And out of the objects of armor, tell me, what are the two objects needed to guard the heart and guard the mind? First, you have the breastplate. The breastplate that covers the heart in the armor of God. And the second thing is the helmet, the helmet that covers the mind. Now he can chop, the devil can chop your hands, he can chop your feet, but you'll still be mobile. But if he wants to kill you, all he needs to do is pierce your heart and there you are dead. Or he needs to damage your mind and there you are. Even if you're not dead, you're walking around like that for the rest of your life. You're paralyzed. So these are two things we need to protect. And the way we protect our heart is wearing the breastplate and the armor of God says the breastplate is the breastplate of righteousness. You know what the devil does to you? I know he does it to you because he does it to me all the time. He will constantly say, you haven't prayed today. You haven't read your Bible today. You haven't gone for mass today. You've read the Bible, but you don't do what it says. You are a hypocrite. You're not a good Christian. How many times does he say this to you? And you believe him. Don't you believe him? And here is the number one lesson I want us to learn, and I really want us to learn it here tonight. If we believe that the righteousness we have come from what we do, the devil will get you all the time. So never ever think that you are too holy. Because the first thing he will do after you're holy, imagining you're holy, you're this guy who goes for prayer meetings, you're this guy who goes to church, you're this guy who fasts, you're this guy who prays. One morning you wake up, one morning you wake up and somehow you're in a bad mood, you get in your car and you drive. Somebody cuts in the way and you're cursing him for the next five minutes. And what is the devil going to say to you? There. You call yourself a Christian? Look at you. You have no patience. You have no kindness. You have no cool. You have nothing. But if you know that your righteousness comes from faith in Christ Jesus, he will not be able to do anything to you. And this is what we need to remember all the time, constantly, is that our righteousness does not come from what we do, but from what Jesus did for us. Do we understand that? We need to understand that here today. Many of us talk about the Holy Spirit convicting of sin. How many of you believe he does that? Don't raise your hands. I know you're afraid whenever I ask you to raise your hands to do so. The Holy Spirit does not convict us of sin. The Holy Spirit convicts us of righteousness. In the Gospel of John, Jesus tells his apostles he's about to go to heaven, but when he goes there, he's going to send his spirit. And then he says these words, when the spirit comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. Then listen to this. In regard to sin, because men do not believe in me. In regard to righteousness, because I'm going to the father where you can never see me longer. And in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. He will convict the world of sin because of its unbelief in Jesus. Do you believe in Jesus? So what's he going to convict you of? He's not going to convict you of sin. But he is going to convict you of righteousness. And this means what? This means reminding you every time you do something wrong that Jesus still loves you, that he still accepts you, and nothing is going to take that away. Are you listening to me? You know the story of Peter? You know the story because I've told it too many times. But even if you don't know it, you know that Peter betrayed Jesus. Not betrayed, denied Jesus three times. After promising Jesus, he was never going to do that again. And what happened? He denied Jesus. He was asked, do you know Jesus? He said no. He was asked again, do you know Jesus? He said no. He was asked the third time, do you know Jesus? He says no. And then the cock crow, just like Jesus told him it would. And then scripture says the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. What do you think Peter saw in Jesus' eyes? Disappointment? Anger? All he saw was love. What Jesus was telling Peter, hey dude, it's cool with me. I need you to listen. Hey, it's cool with me. 
I know you're upset. I know you messed up, but it's cool with me. Imagine Peter had denied Jesus again. You think Jesus would have looked at him differently? Jesus would still have looked at him the same way and said to him, it's cool with me. Have you fallen? Last week, did you tell Jesus, never again am I going to fall? And did you fall again yesterday? Jesus is looking at you now and he's saying, it's cool with me. Because your righteousness does not come from what you do. Your righteousness comes from what I did for you. And I made you righteous in my sight. That is the breastplate of righteousness we're required to wear. Now, a lot of people say that this attitude will only make us sin more. Forget about it. If I know that my sins have been forgiven once, you think I'm going to be committing the same sin again? No way. I'm going to be trying harder to make sure that I don't disappoint my God who can look at me with that love time and time again. So this is going to make me stronger because that breastplate of righteousness is also going to give me the spirit of God that is going to start working in me more and more powerful. And the second thing he gives us is this helmet of salvation. And what is the helmet of salvation? It is the devil once again coming and saying, hey, look, man, you know, you're sick, you're miserable, your life is going to pieces. Yeah, you think you've believed in Jesus and Jesus saved you and Jesus blessed you, but nothing is happening in your life. Forget about it. But if you have this helmet of salvation on, you will know that you have been saved no matter what. Now, I know Catholics have a big problem with this. You know, we're not sure still whether we're saved or not. You are saved. And more than saved, you are blessed. And more than blessed, you got every single thing that God has to give you, given to you right now because of the fact you're his children. And when the devil comes to you and he whispers these things, you tell him, I'm not listening to you. I'm not interested in you. But salvation is more than being saved. Salvation is also getting the healing, getting the blessings, getting the power that God wants to give in our lives. I got a testimony this morning that I want to share with you. It's from this lady in Canada. My name is Rosemary. I have a little son, Joshua, who is six years old. A few months ago, you came to get seminary ministries in Toronto and give a talk. In the talk, you mentioned how you prayed with a few people who had allergies and how they were healed. And you said God would listen to our prayers too if we made them in faith. My son Joshua had severe allergies to shellfish and shrimps, and we could not give any of it to him. His allergy tests confirmed this fact, that he was allergic to seafood. But after your talk, I was inspired to pray for him, asking the Lord to cure Joshua of all his allergies. A few days later, I gave him some shrimps, and praise God, he had no problems whatsoever. <laughs> he is fine. All glory and honor and praise to Jesus. Thank you for giving me the inspiration and building the faith in me. What happened here? What happened here? It, it's something that happens to all of us. You have a small problem. And the devil comes and says, Big problem. He can't eat. Seafood. You go to the doctor. The doctor says, yes. Big problem. He can't eat seafood. If you give him shellfish, he will die. So better not to give him anything. And what do you do? Every place you go, every place you go, you will tell the people over there, I'm sorry, my son can't eat prawns because... He's allergic to them, and if he eats them, he will die. What are you doing? Think about it for a minute. What are you doing? We glorify the guy every time we say, my son is like this, and my son is like that. Think about the problems you have in your life, and the times you testify about these problems. Why don't I talk about my problems? You think I don't have any? Because I don't believe in talking about them, because the moment I talk them, I give witness to them. Just like when you give witness to Jesus, you praise him. When you give witness to these things, you're praising the devil. You might not mention him by name, but you're giving him the praise that he thinks is his or his due. My marriage is in a problem. My wife is like this. My son is like this. I am addicted to this and I'm addicted to that. And my finances are low and I'm in debt and I'm struggling. And I'm all the time, all the time. Change that. Change that and give glory to God and say, my son is your child. He's a temple to your spirit. There's no reason he should 
be allergic to seafood or, or, or meat or anything on this side. That is all I taught her. That is all I teach everybody. She's one person who went home and said, let me try this. And that is why she saw the result of it. And all of you here can go trying it, wearing that helmet of salvation and saying, I am saved. Jesus died not only for my iniquities, but also for my infirmities. This is what the word of God says. Jesus is near me. He's my friend. If I ask you for something, are you really telling me he's not going to give it to me? Really? But no, you believe. No, it's only Anil he listens to. So we'll go from here and you'll call me after a week and say, Brother Anil, please can I come and meet you because I need you to pray for me to God. Why? God is not going to listen to you? This is what we need to do. This is what we need to change. Stop talking about that guy and start talking about your God instead. And this is what we need to know. Here is where the war takes place. Here is where you defeat him. And the next time he comes to you with any kind of thought that does not give glory to God. And every single thought that he tries to plant in our heads does not give glory to God. You're sick, you're miserable, you're depressed, you're sad. Just say, no. No. I believe in my God who is near me. I will stand firm wearing the breastplate of righteousness, knowing that anybody can say anything, they can't touch my integrity, which does not come from what I do, but comes from what Jesus did. I'm standing firm. You throw whatever you want at me, they just bounce off. The devil says whatever he wants, it just bounces off. So I have my helmet of salvation. I believe in every word in the gospel, and my mind is firm because of that. And because of that, every thought I think will be noble. Somebody says something against me, I will not stoop to his level. I will not stoop to her level because it's the devil's level that I'm stooping to, not the person's. I will instead rise higher and I will be noble in what I say. I have the devil coming to me and telling me that I need to masturbate or watch pornography. I will say no. I will think pure thoughts instead. I will think thoughts of holiness. I will think thoughts that are pleasing to God and the devil will have to run for me. I will think things that are right and not things that are wrong. I will not think of going and getting myself drunk and getting other people drunk with me. I will instead stay sober and help other people who might have a problem with alcohol to come and stay sober too. That is what I will do in my head. That is what I will think. I will think what is lovely. I will think what is admirable. I will think about whatever is good. I will think about whatever is excellent. And this is what God is saying to you guys here today. Win the battle for your mind. You go home today, he's going to say a lot of things to you. Trust me. Trust me. You're going to go home with your problems. Nothing is going to really leave you. But when they come, start speaking words of life. Start speaking words of truth. Start speaking words of affirmation. Start speaking words of victory. <laughs>